Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Simons Theater and the New England Aquarium. And uh, welcome to Building a Home for Black Excellence in Marine Science, conversation with Dr. Tierra Moore, presented by the New England Aquarium Lecture Series. I'm John Mandelman. Uh, I'm the Chief Scientist and Vice President of our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life here at the Aquarium, which represents our ocean conservation science, policy, and advising arm. I'm also the uh, interim vice president of our animal care division here at the aquarium. And it's such an honor and pleasure to have you all here tonight, as well as to our virtual audience tuning in remotely. A couple of housekeeping items for our audience here in the building. Uh, if you need to use the restroom, top of the stairs through that exit sign. Uh, also, please silence your cell phones now or put them on vibrate so that we don't have that interruption during the lecture. The aquarium is a nonprofit organization, conservation organization, that has protected and cared for our ocean and the marine animals, habitats, and ecosystems within it for more than 50 years, 54 years to be exact. We are delighted tonight to be hosting Dr. Moore and grateful to the Lowell Institute for their generous support for this lecture series, which allows us to offer these lectures free to the public. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Moore, shares our passion for marine science and ocean conservation and is here to talk about her experiences as a black marine ecologist and activist. In her research, Dr. Moore uses environmental DNA, also known as eDNA, to assess the biodiversity in different ecosystems. Her findings inform management practices aimed at preserving critically important freshwater and marine environments. She's also the founder and CEO of Black and Marine Science, or BIMS, She's the BIMS program lead at the Nature Conservancy in Washington State. Dr. Moore founded this nonprofit organization in 2020 to celebrate black marine scientists, spread environmental awareness, and inspire the next generation of scientific thought leaders. BIMS also works to remove barriers for black professionals and others seeking careers in marine science while celebrating black marine scientists currently in our field. Dr. Moore is also the founder of Awoke Space LLC, a consulting and training company focused on changing the cultural climate for women of color in the workplace. She holds a bachelor's degree in science, a BS in biology from Winthrop University, a master's degree in biology with a concentration in environmental science from Hampton University, and finally a doctorate in ecology and evolutionary biology from UCLA. And she completed her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington and the Nature Conservancy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore to the stage. All right. Thank you. Is this on? Am I good? All right. Well, let me get set up. I put the timer on. Maybe not. Maybe I'll talk fast today. Thank you all so much for coming out. Like I said, in this weather, I was not prepared. So I thank you all for being here and for being prepared to join me so I wasn't just in here by myself because that would have been so sad. I've been like, dang, they flew me all the way out to Boston. All right, so I think I have about 20 minutes or so to talk to y'all about building a home for black excellence in marine science. And so we have a double slide. Sorry, but here is my original slide and then there is my handle. So go ahead and just start following me now because you will love the experience of following me on social media. Okay, um, I like to begin all of my talks just really just talking about myself, who I am, and just setting the stage. So about me, I identify as a black queer woman. I'm also plus size, which I'm so grateful for with this weather because I wasn't prepared, so I'm just extra insulated. Um, and I also have ADHD, so I move around a bit during my talk. So just to let you know, that's me. Um, I'm also a marine ecologist, as you all heard. Um, I'm the founder of Black and Marine Science, as well as the BIMS program lead at the Nature Conservancy. And so, what is BIMS? BIMS is this premier organization um, that's really aimed to celebrate Black marine scientists, spread environmental awareness, and inspire the next generation of scientific thought leaders. And I'm so grateful for the leadership and my board of directors there on the screen, so I always have to shout them out, give you a few seconds to read through their names. 
You don't have time to Google anybody, but just know they lit. <laughs> they give me really, really good advice and guidance on how we really want to run this organization to be able to meet those pillars of our mission. And so when I start talking about BIMS, people really are usually asking me, well, how did we get here? And so my experience as a marine ecologist was one that was sometimes quite isolating, quite isolating to the point where I actually wrote a whole article about being the only black person in the room. And so this came of after years of, you know, working to get this degree and doing different leadership positions, no matter what, if I was on a board of directors or anything else, I was usually the only black person in the room. And so when any issues of race or anything come, they will always ask me a question or, or <laughs> there were some times when I would come into these spaces and I would be seen as someone who would be there to give them their coffee. Like, hey, hey, you coming to grab the plates? I'm like, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> you know, like those, that was my experience. Times where I would come in and introduce myself as a marine scientist and people would make comments like, oh, you can swim or you get your hair wet. These were my experiences just trying to be a marine scientist in this space. And so I really got to a point where I started to ask myself, what am I doing here? Like, it doesn't matter that I have this degree, I'm the whole Dr. Moore, but are still treating me as if I don't belong. And so it was very disappointing. And so as you heard in my um, introduction, I have a consulting firm called Awoke Space. And so that's what I started prior to Black and Marine Science to really try to train folks of how to work with me. Because what I had heard is they had never worked with a Black woman with a PhD before. They wasn't used to that. You know, it was a different experience. And I'm like, whoa, that's so interesting, but you've worked with people before. And so it was really like a barrier that had to be broken down. But in 2020 happened, and there was a lot more things that were unearthed <laughs> in this space. And so it was a whole lot more that was required. And that's where Black and Marine Science really was founded to try to say, hey, not only are we here in marine science, yes, we're here, but we are having experiences that aren't the best. And our colleagues are hiding behind initiatives and committees and not really treating us the right way when we're in these spaces. Because I just shared with you, these are my colleagues who said some of these things to me. So fast forward, now we have BIMS. And so here's my BIMS team, looks a little bit different than the picture that was before. And these are, I would say, my ride or die folks. The folks that, if you've heard about black and marine science, it's literally because of these people. So I always love to shout them out. Um, but when I think about you know, black and marine science and what it is that we do, I just look at the pillars of our mission. And so the first one is celebrating black marine scientists. We do a whole lot of stuff just to create space. A lot of us are still the only black person in our lab or at our job, and that's gonna take some time to change just because of conditions and things. But now we have this virtual community. So now here, that's one lab represented in every, all over the world. So I think that's what we realize that there is one of us in each lab, and guess what, it's a thousand labs. There's a thousand of us. So if we come together, what can we do to create resources, create opportunities to, to dismantle barriers that are in place that allowed us to be the only person in the room in the first place? So we have a whole series of initiatives that we do to celebrate black marine scientists. Um, I'll just run through a few and I have some photos more photos later, but our BIMS Bites, BIMS Bites Kids and BIMS Dives is our whole BIMS TV series. So you'll see this barcode up here that I'm very proud of. You can scan it <laughs> and you will be subscribed to our YouTube channel. So go ahead, a collective scan of the YouTube, but you're probably already subscribed. Um, but this is where we put a lot of our content out. And the goal of the YouTube channel is here is a free resource that can put content, create educational material, but also change the face of who people see as scientists, while also creating educational material for the most impacted folks. Um, we also have our BIMS Cares, where we do things like bring in a therapist or do trap yoga together. Um, we have BIMS Week, where it's a whole celebration, a virtual celebration of marine scientists uh, all on uh, virtually. 
We have our BIMS Tide Away program, which is a new program that we were able to implement last year. We were able to taste people, people to a scientific conference so they could present. And then we also had an event, like a whole networking event at this conference that introduced community members as well as scientists. And we had a whole jazz band. It was in New Orleans. It was really, it was pretty fun. Um, and then uh, our BIP week, and this is our BIMS immersion program where we're able to get students scuba dive certified, get them hands-on experiences in like coral reef restoration or shark tagging, um, and then allow them to work with scientists in the lab for the week. There's research, there's outreach, and there's paid opportunities as well. So I would say all of these things really help us to come together to just provide opportunities for these black marine scientists that are already existing in the field, but also showing um, ways for more people to get into the field. Secondly, is spreading environmental awareness. We do a whole lot of programs. We do a whole lot of panels and really talking about different things that is going on in the environment, um, but also how that is shaped by, you know, our experiences as black people. Um, one thing that we talk about, we have a panel, I think it's like diving while black. Um, it's about how you even take care of natural hair when you're diving. That's something that you never hear anybody talking about. You say, oh, hey, black women don't get their hair wet. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about taking care of your hair after you get out of this salty ocean. You know, like, why is it a barrier? Where is the resource? I'm also talking about pipetting with nails on. There's so much conversation happens about me and my nails. I wish y'all would understand. But people who are just not as skilled as me as far as I'm concerned, like, oh, Tierra, how do you get any work done with those nails on? Are y'all serious? These are my hands. But these are the types of conversations and microaggressions that just get to you and they gnaw at you and people are being funny. But it's like, no, you're trying to tell me that because I have these nails on, I can't do my work. I'm not as good as you. And it's like, no, I'm actually pretty good if I can do all this with these nails on, if you think about it. So it's really trying to change these, these comments that can be seen as damaging, but really showing us that no, this is our power and we can stand in that and be fine. <laughs> And then lastly is inspiring the next generation of scientific thought leaders, my favorite part. So this is just bringing up, making room for the next generation. So up here at the very top corner is Addie. And so Addie is the youngest BIMS member. And so she actually reached out and was like, hey, I want to do an event at my school. And so we sent her all the materials and she had this shark tube day at her school that she hosted. And this is because she just found them. She was, she said, I wanted to be a marine scientist, but I didn't know if we could do that. And this was in 2020, luckily. <laughs> if she would have looked before, maybe she wouldn't have seen us. And then her mom reached out and got her involved. Um, down here in this next picture is our STEM hands camp. So this is a camp that we have been able to do for deaf um, youth in Atlanta. And so they're able to we have a whole camp, STEM camp, do marine science exercises, and we bring in interpreters so that they can um, have access. That photo in the middle is from our BIMS Tideaway program, the one I was talking about. So here we were able to have this whole booth set up at this conference. This was something that was completely different experience because you go to these conferences, you see all these booths and there's not really a space for, for people like me. <laughs> And then, so we were able to have this booth there, but also bring these students to participate. Up at the top um, is from an example from when we actually went to the Essence Festival. I don't know if y'all are familiar, but the Essence Festival is one of the largest <laughs> celebrations of black culture in, in probably in the world, but here in America. And so when I was thinking about going to the Essence Fest, I was like, all right, we're talking about how do we engage more black people? How do we get more black youth inspired? Well, you go where we are and the Essence Festival is the largest event. And so we signed up, I was very nervous. I was like, they're not gonna accept us in this. We're not gonna get in. But then they reached out and was like, whoa, y'all wanna do this? I didn't even know we did this. We would love to have y'all there. And it was such a hit of seeing parents come in, bringing their kids there, but also just being so excited, like, wow, I wish I would have had this when we were younger, because I didn't even know this was a real career. And then down at the bottom is our um, BIP week, our BIMS immersion program, where we get our students scuba certified. So when I think about, you know, all the things that we have done, you know, I now have to think about, okay, what is the next steps or what are the impact? And so over these last two and a half years, we have seen a lot of growth. 
we now have 320 members in 31 different countries. So that barcode there is to apply for a membership and I'll have more information about that later. So 320 members, that's 320 black marine scientists all over the world that say, hey, I wanna get involved, I wanna get support, I wanna you know, be, be, um, have this amplification. Our YouTube channel that I talked about, it now has 1.8 thousand subscribers and over 32,000 views. And I'll just give you a little preview as you go ahead and pull out your phone and subscribe. <laughs> but here's our little BMC. Okay, so we have our ASL on all of them to make them accessible. And they're really just black marine scientists all over the world sharing different bites of their research. So there's episodes about nitrogen pollution, about estuaries, about coral reefs, about sharks, about anything you can really think of. And it has, the goal is to really be able to break down that topic of marine science, but also provide the scientist who actually is doing that work. Because there's so many comments that, oh, well, we don't do this research. We don't do that, re yes. Here's one of us doing all of that. <laughs> so we show that and say, hey, here is how you can get into this space as well. And then lastly, you love to talk about money. We have raised over $2 million in funding and that is just, whew, just like mind blowing in itself, but it's largely due to all of these logos that you see on the screen, all of these supporters, all these people who have believed in the work that we are doing and that what we're trying to change. And so now I have to ask myself, <laughs> now what? So I'll play this little video. Ocean is so important. Like it's so important, it really runs and it's the reason why we're alive. So I think what I'm trying to do is basically change how people think about marine science in general. I think that's the problem. It's seen as something lame. It's seen as something for white people. And I'm like, no, marine science is lit. Oh, yeah, you can give me a clap for that. You can give me a clap. <laughs> but no, I think really um, that's what I really noticed in a lot of my work, that it is not about this lack of interest. I think I was told so long, being the only black person in the room and talking with my colleagues like, oh, well, y'all don't apply for anything or y'all won't come. And I'm like, well, what is really the issue? Why is that the case? What is it about marine science that makes it seem like we're not welcome here, that we don't belong? And I think it's how it is pitched. And it is seen, like I said, it's something that is not a space for us. But when you have someone saying like, oh, marine science is lit, then you're more likely to, like, oh, well, is it? Like, what, what is this? Now, ears are perking up. I have students who never even thought about marine science at all saying like, whoa, I could do this. I could be a scuba diver. We can do this. This is so exciting. So I think it was really about the, the rep that marine science actually had and what we were perpetuating as marine scientists. And I perpetuated that myself. I know when I first got in the field, I had like real bone straight hair and I talked a little bit different. And I, cause I didn't feel like I could be who I was as a marine scientist. And so it wasn't until I started walking into my own truth that I realized that I was never ever going to be the marine scientist that I wanted to be acting that way. And so I had to really embrace who I was to be able to create this path for other folks to get into this space. So when I think about it, so now what, what do we do next? And so that's where this building, this home for black excellence comes from, is my vision for the BIMS Institute. And the BIMS Institute will be this research, outreach, communication, innovation, all the stuff, powerhouse, focused on ocean justice. Because honestly, when I think about marine science, marine science institutions, not only is the inside of the lab predominantly white, you go to the outside of the lab in the city that you have to walk around in, it's also predominantly white. And that was largely my experience when I was living in Seattle. So here I am, Dr. Moore again. I go home with my, I don't know, thousands of dollars of rent with my key fob that they, that they made you have. And then there was a neighbor who slammed the door in my face. You don't live here. Where do I live with this key fob? You know, like, what do you do? And so these things happen so quickly. And you just have put in a situation where like, well, yes, I use you close the door, but let me just pull my key fob, open the door, come right after you. You're gonna hold the elevator, you know, like that's what your experience is. And then you have to get up, go to work, and deal with that at work. And that is 
so sad. And I think it's so disappointing that we're not talking about it largely. We can say, hey, we can have all these diversity hires and that's great, but you're still putting people in an unsafe situation in the city that the place is at. And you just can't change that. And that's just point blank, period. So I feel like it's really time for us to have some real conversations about what the true needs are to truly, to truly see the impact to marine science, because that's what's the most important. So that's what I think about with the BIMS Institute. How can we partner with maybe an HBCU or a community where people of color actually live, black people are, who are experiencing the most impacts of climate change, whose houses are literally flooding away due to sea level rise, but nobody's there talking to them. And I think when I really thought about it, Toni Morrison said it best, the very serious function of racism is distraction. And I think I'll even admit, I've been a little bit distracted trying to make people want to welcome me even, want to sit, invite me to their table. But I think what I found is when you make your own table, people start inviting you. They start inviting you to the table. They start seeing what you can bring. And I think, like I said, the distraction is we're talking about me learning how to swim or knowing how to swim when the real point is the ocean is on fire. The ocean literally is on fire. You have people gatekeeping, making it hard to get more people to become scientists when we know that there are so many marine impacts going on with nutrient pollution, climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss. We say the, the, the seventh mass extinction or six, whatever. All of these things going on. And so you have to see that that's what's important, not about people wondering if I can swim. And if those are the people who are the gatekeepers, and that's, that needs to be called out. And we can't keep awarding this bad behavior. And I feel like that's really the goals of Black and Marine Science, to say, hey, here is a space where we can have this safe space to really actually do the science that we want to do. Do you have to not worry about somebody asking you questions about your nails versus like, oh, hey, them is cute. You know, like that's, that's really it. And you can focus on what actually matters. So I would say that is my work. That is the goals. And so really we're fundraising hard and heavy for the BIMS Institute to get, and as you saw those supporters, it's like, hey, how can we build a space, create this safe space for black marine scientists to actually thrive? And it's not about um, like segregating other universities, it's about acknowledging that we just won't be safe in these particular areas. But the ultimate goal the ultimate goal is to really save our ocean and to produce scientists who can put, have impactful work. I would say to further this point is that, you know, while I was doing my postdoc, I couldn't necessarily produce the work that I wanted to do because it was just so much trauma and stuff going on. So you lose that quality science that we should have. And so I think that's what we have to start thinking about moving forward is like, how can we put, provide safe spaces for our scientists so we can actually do that work. So yeah, so hopefully I've convinced you. And so you will want to um, join in on the mission. And so to become a member of BIM, so we have, like I said, 320 members all over the world now. Um, we have our BIMS memberships and we actually recently launched our ally and organizational memberships. And so where that came from is that we had a lot of folks who aren't black <laughs> who wanted to support the work. And so what we said is like, how can we create ally memberships that will actually now support our BIMS members? So that's what we did. So we have our BIMS memberships. There's everything there. Um, it comes with our BIMS drip bag. And you have all of these just opportunities when you come into the BIMS space. Actually, that's the old shirt. The new shirt is this one when you sign up. Um, and so... We have this, and so like I said, we have all of our BIMS members have a safe space network. They have access to paid opportunities. We have all of our, all the programming that I talked about earlier, like the scuba classes and all that are free of charge to our BIMS members. So once you become a member, you have access to all of that. And so we recently added our ally membership, and this immediately supports a BIMS member. So once you sign up, you automatically support one of our BIMS members. So if they don't have the funding, then they can um, be supported. 
you also get a bag. And then you have the ability to post on our BIMS job board. This is important because so many people reach out to us like, hey, basically we looking for black people, can you post a job? And I'm like, ew, no. Why, why would I do that? Like, why do you think this is okay? So we actually have a process where when people send us a job, I'm like, hey, we're gonna vet you, look through it. And then we actually won't post any jobs if they don't have the salary, period. We know that black people always have received lower salaries. And that's largely because we might not necessarily know what the salary is. I will give you an example. We had someone send us a job description. They didn't have the salary listed. I read it. I was like, Ugh, maybe 85K. I don't know. But I asked. I said, hey, we won't post it unless you give us the salary. They were like, no, we won't give it to you. So I said, OK, well, we won't post it. They was like, OK, the starting salary is 120K. I about fell out of my seat. So imagine if you go into this job and you thought the salary was 85K, then they offer you 90. And you're like, oh, yay, this is great. Never even knowing that 110 was the starting. And those are the practices in predatory recruitment that we see. You're offered one, people are offered one salary and then they get another. And we, we're not calling it out, but we are at BIM. So we don't do none of that, none of that. And then our organizational members, and that's just for larger folks, because there's, you know, you, hopefully there's usually one more than one ally in the organization. And this helps us to support five BIMS members immediately. You get access to that same um, ally network, hosting our jobs. You also get access to the ally forum that lets y'all go ahead and talk to each other so you don't have to pick my brain because my brain has been picked. So this is now provides the same space for allies that are of the same like mind. Like, hey, we're gonna talk about best practices, things that are working in our organization. And of course you have access to talking to us as well. How did I end this? <laughs> How did I end this? Okay. Um, so as I've been here yeah, thinking about this work, a lot of people ask like, well, how do you stay so excited? You're talking about racism, you're talking about trauma, you're talking about people thinking you can't swim, you know, how, how do you not get burnt out? And it's, it's, it's justice for me. Um, someone made a comment and said, oh, you know, you're risking your career by being so vocal. And my reply was, well, I'm risking my life by being silent. And I think that's what people have to understand. This is why this work is so important for me because there were times crying in bathrooms after a colleague had slammed another door in my face that the career didn't matter. I'm thinking like, yo, I'd rather go work at McDonald's than deal with this. You know how sad that is? When you work so hard to be somewhere? and nobody wants you there. So for me, this is about justice. This is about freedom. This is about liberation. This is about my ancestors' dreams. And it's time. So I hope you all will agree and continue to support this work because Black and Marine Science, the BIMS Institute, is the change that we need in. And I truly, I truly believe that. Thank y'all so much for listening. All right, come on up here. This is the fun part where we get to sit in these really comfortable chairs. <laughs> yes, I'm like, I'm excited about this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moore, for that amazing presentation. Oh, thank you. Definitely learned a ton. Um, <laughs> So now we have the opportunity to hear some questions or thoughts from the audience, as well as our virtual audience online. And what I'm going to do is repeat every question that comes in from our live audience, and then I'm going to be getting transmissions from the virtual audience in real time, and we'll try to mix and match what we get. But we'll start with questions from the audience. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Moore? Is that
forward from how how we are going to start but we know we need to be able to do it and 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 to be able to
creating the culture that's conducive to DEA and I growth and voice? Yeah, so cultural transformation is the most important thing. And I feel like that's why I had to start BIMS and run it the way that I have, because some about what I talked about in my talk, you know, we'll see a diversity hire and they'll bring in three black or brown people and then it's <laughs> And that's it. And nothing about the culture has changed. You know, I don't even know if the department knew that they were bringing in the people sometimes because they act like they didn't even know that it was happening. So there hasn't been any like preparation or bringing people into the space. So I feel like that is just the first thing. There has to just be conversations like, hey, we're all doing this. It's not just this one ally who wrote a grant. It's the whole department that you're putting this person in. And really the whole university for this place would be the whole aquarium. Um, something that I specifically think for the aquariums I actually met with Vicky today um, would to be have like more, I would say, humanization in the aquarium. So imagine you have a pop up exhibit here where we have BIM scientists who do who work with these particular organisms right beside it, you know, like just hey, here's my face and look a little bio or blurb. Um, so this is a way where you can actually match what's going on with the ocean with the actual scientists that are doing it. And I think now we can no longer say like, oh, we don't know any black marine scientists. No, we do. And we can literally match them with all the organizations, all the organisms that's in this aquarium and put their, put a spotlight. So I think it's about creating spaces and putting up spaces and putting us into these spaces as well. Um, so, yeah. We have a, a good question here from the chat online. And I think this goes back to what you were talking about with your time in Seattle. So Dr. Moore, what kinds of community support do you wish you had during your time in Washington? Do you have any recommendations on how organizations in predominantly white towns could help students, interns of color, feel safer and more welcome when they work with us? Ooh, that's such a great question just because I think the experiences I had, I never expected to experience. So it's so hard that people ever did it for me to know how to say, but I'll just give an example. So I would say, maybe I wish this wouldn't have happened. When I first got there, you know, I was told I was going to have lunch and I was like, oh, okay, like who's this lunch going to be with? And it was with the secretary of the department. I'm like, well, why am I having lunch with the secretary? I'm like for what? You know, like I'm going to post that. Like I should be meeting other colleagues, other scientists. And then of course I get in there and she's a black woman. And I'm like, oh, that's why I'm having lunch with the secretary, because she's the only black woman in this whole place and they wanted me to have, I guess, a friend. Like, I don't really know. But it's like, those are situations that kind of makes it even worse. Because it's like, you think I can only talk to black people? Like, so you don't put me in a situation where I'm actually getting like the science mentorship that I want is like, oh, here's the secretary, go, go chat with her, because this is all we can offer you. So I think that lack of representation and mentorship all the way up in academia and the professory, you see, is the reason why we like see not, I guess, a lot of retention and transition and people continuing in the space, in, the, in academia, largely. Thanks. But I mean, I would say how, what could you provide? I would say it is more, what is it? It's more, it's, it's so hard because I, for me, the experiences were so bad that it made me just feel like they never really cared. So I don't know how that could have been made better. Like, I don't know. So I was like, I just don't wanna work with them no more. How do we create other spaces where you can still thrive? I think that's what I'm trying to get at. There was a time where you can only maybe do science in academia, or you can only thrive if you work with certain mentors. But I don't know if that has to continue to be the case. You know, that leads me to a follow-up question. Um, Early in the presentation, you talked about sort of the lack of being the only person of color in the room. Um, did you have any mentors that trailblazed before you that you looked up to? And not necessarily just in marine science, but in STEM in general that you look to and you're like, that, that's a vision that I want to, that I emulate. This is so hard. You're trying to get me in trouble. I think <laughs> I've met, <laughs> I think I've met folks like much after. I feel like yeah, there was definitely black people in the space that I saw growing up in marine science, but they were also in spaces where they were the only black person. You know, I talk about I went to an HBCU. The HBCU didn't have a lot of black professors in the marine science department. So while it was an HBCU, I got the experience of being on a campus that's predominantly black, but in the department that wasn't necessarily the case. You know, totally. so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, hi. Thank you, Dr. Moore. This is great. I uh, was wondering, I have a nephew who's studying marine science. He's black at University of Rhode Island. And I'm wondering if your efforts in uh, university spaces are limited to HBCUs or like, I can't wait to go 
talk to him. And he'll probably say he knows all about you already. He's going to say, if he at University of Rhode Island, I hope he do, baby. <laughs> 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 but no, I'm playing. Um, but no, he probably does. URI has supported our work, actually. I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. Really so the question was, um, is Dr. Moore working with universities beyond HBCUs? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're working with everyone. I would say everyone who authentically really wants to partner with them, we are working with. So we have partnerships with other universities, like University of South Florida. Um, I'm actually giving a talk at the University of Rhode Island um, in next month, <laughs> yeah, so he, he might be coming to that talk. So yeah, we are definitely trying to work with folks who actually want the change. And I would say in 2020, when we first started really largely in 2021, we saw a lot of that checkboxing. People who just wanted, like I said, pick my brain, um, develop diversity committees without any resources. How you develop a committee and don't give them no budget, y'all? Like, what was the purpose of the committee? Like for real, you know? So like those, those types of things. And when I saw that, I was like, mm, that's not really the path that I want. Like who are the people who actually want to see changes in their different departments, in their different organizations? And that's who we largely partner with now. And so those were a lot of the sponsors that I had on the, on the page. Um, but yeah, we're open to working with literally anyone who truly wants to do this work. Question from the online audience. Amazing talk, Dr. Moore. Does BIMS incorporate traditional indigenous knowledge in any of its educational videos? Mm, that is a great question. I would say it has not been, I feel like we have some videos where we have different like ways, like different methods and different ways that you can do science, but I'm not sure it has been the largest focus in our educational content, but definitely thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, I think the, traditional, the way that we look at our education is like, how can we make it the most accessible, but also related to people's experiences of what they are having going on, but we haven't necessarily looked at TEK. Um, hi, uh, so, um, sorry, thanks, I love that. Um, so, I guess my first question is, um, for people of other demographics, like uh, people who are women, LGBT, or, um, Great question. So the question from the audience was for other types of diversity, LGBTQ, um, neurodiverse, um, what would be the advice that you would give? Um, and then likewise, how did you get into marine science in the first place, Dr. Moore? <laughs> All right, so I would say for the first part, for the, I guess the other identities, that's why I would say I started with all of my identities because I identify as a lot of what you said. And I would say it's about finding the space that we need to succeed and then finding that little voice inside yourself to advocate for what it is that you need. I would say that was the biggest breakthrough for me, like me figuring out what I needed and then like, you know, being sad, like, why are they treating me this way? Why are they treating me this way? It's like, then I think the question was, why am I allowing them to treat me this way? Why am I not saying anything? Like, girl, talk. And so I think that was the breakthrough moment is like, it was scary. I probably was shaking about to like crack, you know, but once I finally started talking, I was like, oh, now you can't shut me up. Now I don't have any problem talking. I love calling folks out. Enjoy it. Best part of my day. <laughs> but so I think that's really what it is. It's like, fine what it is that you need because you belong in this space. I think that is a take home message. We all belong in this space. If you wanna be a scientist, if you wanna be whatever, and no one should be there telling you that they that you don't belong simply because they're afraid that you're honestly gonna do better than them. <laughs> That's what it's really about. Um, so I would say just to find that space and just and own it. Um, and then how did I get in marine science? So I was already an undergrad actually, so I went to um, Winthrop pre-med because I had watched the Cosby show and I was gonna be a pediatrician and that was the only thing I could do. Um, and then I realized I didn't really like working with kids like that, so it wasn't <laughs> gonna work out. Um, but then I didn't wanna change my major, so I'm like, I'm in bio, I have to say, you know, I'm like, what am I gonna do? So I just started taking these other electives. 
And so there was this tropical ecology course, and I only signed up because they were going to Costa Rica for spring break. So I was like, ooh, ooh, free trip, yes, go. But then I got there, right, and we were on a boat, and we we're collecting water samples, and we're doing these little experiments, and like the water is changing color because it has nutrients or something. But I'm like, ah. And then there was like senior scientists there teaching us, and I'm like, are y'all getting paid? Like, is this a job? Like, what is this that you do? Like, what is this thing? And that's how I found out about marine science. And I like came back and I've been doing that ever since. Like I applied to grad school and I remember writing in my personal statement, like, hey, I took this one class, but I'm excited about it. Please let me in. And they did, they didn't give me no scholarships though. But <laughs> they let me in. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you can just, you can pay for yourself. <laughs> but, um, but but once I got there, literally I was there for like one semester and I, you know, like was so excited about it that I found an advisor who did have money to be able to offer me a grant so I didn't have to pay the whole time. But yeah, that was my story. Just that random elective like changed my life. And so I think that's why we try to offer these opportunities, hands-on experiences through BIMS, because if you've never even heard of marine science and you're already in college, you're like, dang, I didn't know that was a thing, but maybe you did this class, maybe I've done that class in high school, that would have been cool, or earlier in undergrad, so, yeah. So I have a question. As someone who's clearly CEO, trailblazer, doing so much amazing stuff, are you finding time for your research? And is there a passion area around eDNA or other? You mentioned Costa Rica where you got your feet wet, so to speak. Um, Belize, I know is your main field site. So how is your research going? Oh, that is such a great question. <laughs> so the research, so I'll be honest, like I had to just stop, like I had to take a hard stop just because I was in a space where I wasn't necessarily doing what I love, working with people who I didn't, you know, it was hard. And so now I would say through the work of BIMS, I spent so much time just, I would say creating a healing space for a lot of other marine scientists, but largely for myself. So where I would say I got the confidence in myself as a scientist back because it was depleted just from just a lot of just the foolishness that I had been through. And so through BIMS now, I'm able to write grants to do research projects. And so I'm actually very excited, I can announce this publicly, that we got a $750,000 grant from the Packard Foundation to start the BIMS Institute and do our first like big eDNA project in the Chesapeake Bay um, in Hampton Roads. <laughs> So, so yeah, so that's, that's very exciting. So I think I've thought, how can I use the power of having all of these marine scientists who could do research and let's just do a project together versus just kind of silo my own, like, you know, the more thing that I was doing back in that, that day. So I would say I've definitely grown to be a lot more collaborative, more big picture, more how can we have 15 projects going on at once, um, that type of thing, than just my own, like, singular research but my hand and like i guess my vision is in it like it's still an eDNA project yeah. biodiversity still the you know the the coastal area um so well, as you continue to get that off the ground you can build that community of scientists that you want to that's your vision that's yes fantastic questions i was like i saw you had a question earlier with the, like blind yeah i'm looking at you you yes oh. you <laughs> sorry just that sorry oh okay Mm -hmm. But my question is, for those professionals or PhD students or master's students, for those who are early in the lab career, but we don't have a support network, we don't want, they love the science, they don't want the environment around them to kind of kind of them going in and out. What kind of advice would you give to those students who are seeking finding out their next step or looking for new ways to kind of stay there? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Delilah. Delilah um, asked a great question. She's in a master's program now and has been following them since 2020. She asked a question about she's passionate, loves the science in her lab as a graduate student, um, but the environment and the culture, if I'm correct, are burning, burning you out, burning her out. What kind of advice does she have or does Dr. Moore have uh, for that sort of situation to keep her, keep her going? That is, that's rough. First of all, congratulations for just graduating. Um, 
I think this is this is why why we now have BIMS. Like, and I feel like that's just like I hate to like be that answer, but that's really why we created it is because there isn't a space. Like you're right, you're in the lab, you're by yourself, things are happening, and nobody else. It happened to nobody else. Like that happened so many times. I'm like, hey y'all, did this happen? Did anybody see anything? No. <laughs> we didn't see nothing. No, nothing. You know, it was like a ghost that was living in the lab. You know, so it's so hard. And so I would say with BIMS, becoming a BIMS member, we have like our hangouts. We just had a we just had a community meeting just the other day where we come and actually just talk about that. And you have a space where you're on Zoom and you can just be real and you're like, yo, this foolishness happened today, let me tell y'all. And you have that safe space. But then we're also doing more programming like where you can just have that system of support where you can come and be involved in one of our scuba classes or one of our um, other programs that we do in outreach. Like you wanna come with us to the Essence Festival. So I think we're building that sense of community so we have these relationships outside of our lab. Because as I mentioned, how long is it gonna take for them to you know, hire more professors? It's gonna take forever. And like, do I have to be unsupported while y'all finding the folks? No. So I think that's what BIMS is trying to be, be that gap of while there is these diversity blooms and we do hope, like I would love for it to be safer and we not have these toxic spaces. But in the meantime, how can we put a little bandaid on it? And I think BIMS has really been good for that. Like I said, I'm still the only black person in the lab, but like I can call like so many folks now and be sending memes and be sending tweets. And it's like, it's so cool. Like I'm not like it's completely different than it was before. So join BAMS and get your department to sponsor you. <laughs> That's it. Couple of great questions coming through in the chat. Um, Dr. Moore, you talked, about, uh, you talked about environmental and social justice. Can you address how you are working these issues into your own work? I mean, it's largely by the people that we work with. I would say the communities that we go into. I'll, in my work as a scientist, I would say we were working in like sometimes pristine conditions of people who didn't even necessarily need the research or the help or the work. And so now I'm working in communities who are impacted by like sea level rise or fishing in Hampton Roads in the Chesapeake Bay area. That's the area that is largely populated by black fishermen who used to run the oyster community that was that as well. So like that's an area that is largely um, black but it's not necessarily in touch with the marine science ecosystem now because of all the climate change that has occurred because there hasn't been a lot of mitigation or restoration specifically in that area. And then also in the work in Belize, that is the, one of the largest black um, countries in Central America. And so like, I think where we're going and where we're looking to do the work is how we're trying to really incorporate this justice aspect because we know that these are the people that are the most impacted. And I can also say we're actually making a documentary <laughs> talking about nutrient pollution, nitrogen pollution, these algal blooms, these things that we see um, impacting like Caribbean community, Caribbean countries, right? So these are predominantly black countries, but where is that nutrient pollution coming from? Not them. It's <laughs> coming from largely from the mainland. We know that's largely from maybe farming and agriculture. And who do they, who do they look like? So we have all these folks who are polluting, but they aren't experiencing the negative impacts down in the Caribbean. You know, so that is what this whole documentary is about: is highlighting that and just putting that out there as something that's going on that people, even in the Caribbean, might not know. They're like, "Whoa, why is all this?" sargassum here, or why is all this stuff here, or why are there less fish? But they're not maybe assessing that it's because of these farmers that are putting all these fertilizers in this washing into the Mississippi, you know? So that's, that's the justice work. Excellent. Ashley. So the, so the question is, um, in terms of microaggressions or any kind of biases or behaviors that Dr. Moore's experienced, is she seeing a change when either she brings that up or they are spending extended amounts of time with her in the same environment? 
Yeah, so this is a funny question because I think I would say yes, but largely I would say because it's me now and I have the platform that I have. So they're largely afraid of being called out on Twitter because they know that I will. So I would say, but no, I would say there is some genuine change too. I'm just being kind of low key petty, but there is some genuine change because, but because of how the messaging has been about. So I would say me talking about it was probably okay a little bit internally, but I think it is when you go and you see a message on Twitter that's gotten like all these likes and comments and tweets and like people are saying they're like, oh dang, what is she talking about? And so then there's conversations of people like with me about like a tweet that I wrote like, so what were you talking about? You know, like, or what does this mean? Or like, how can we do this better? Um, so I think that's really what it did lead to like people, I maybe, I created a safe space for myself for people to ask me more questions and to talk to me. And so I have seen that change for sure. Thanks. So I'll take one more question from the audience and then I have a question virtual and then we'll, we'll wrap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a recommendation to take a look at a different environment near the Ch near the Chesapeake Bay. Never heard yeah. of that bay. It's on the flip side. It's on the ocean side. Mm -hmm. Great recommendation of uh, taking a look at Chincoteague Bay, which has a lot of farming and agricultural um, activity impacts of that potentially. Right, so the last question from the virtual audience. Thank you for the talk, Dr. Moore. What would you say to someone who wants to start a similar initiative? What would you have done differently? And what are the must do's? Oh, goodness. That is a great question. Um, what I've done differently? Uh, I probably would have asked for help sooner. <laughs> I would say that um, I spent a lot of my time on Google, <laughs> a lot of just how do you start a nonprofit? How do you build a board of directors? How do you, you know, how to's? Because I'm a scientist. Like, I literally went to school for all these years to go and just be a scientist. So, being a CEO and running a nonprofit wasn't on my plan at all, but I think I saw the need and I saw that we I could do much more impactful work through the nonprofit space. So I would say if you're going to start this, like understand that you are building an organization that is a business and that I run now run a business. So get advice and support and literally what's the mean what's the give get somebody else to do it. Like for real. Get somebody else to do it who can help you who has that background and that skill set, because we don't have to do everything. Um, I would say that for sure. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore, for your amazing talk and for building a home for Black Excellence in Marine Science. Very grateful for your time here tonight, for giving us all this incredible lesson to take home and, and to continue your, your work. It's amazing. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming out, for real. So just to wrap up, um, tonight's event again, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, thanks to the generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allows us to give these lectures for free. If you enjoyed this program and want to help support the Aquarium's ocean education and conservation work, please consider giving to the Aquarium's Mission Forward Fund at neaq.org. Uh, if you're with us in person this evening, we do have a cash bar in the lobby that'll be open until eight o'clock, so please join us. Um, and if you're with us virtually, tough luck, you can't do that. But uh, really glad that you joined us tonight and Dr. Moore for an amazing, amazing time. Um, we look forward to our continuing fall lecture series on Wednesday, March 8th, with a panel discussion in honor of Women's History Month entitled, A Changing Environment, How Women Leaders in Boston Are Taking the Lead on Climate Resiliency and Community Building. Thank you for coming tonight. And there was some brochures and stuff about BIMS around, so if you didn't get it, you can get one. Thanks, y'all.